darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in eye and wonder the king of glory the king of all our kings. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my you've done for me who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings oh this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my the lamb who was slain and worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain and worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy 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 yeah this is amazing grace you're a dad, you're not afraid to work hard. Never give up. Never compromise. And the best dads always look for ways to get better. I'm looking for something to energize me. I'm looking for something to push me further. And I'm looking for something to go with these nachos. Dad Fuel, the energy drink designed just for dad. So I can finish the fight. So I can finish the race. So I can finish mowing the lawn. And later on, I might watch some golf the fuel dads need to do the things dads do climb the highest peak go the furthest distance check the scores read the newspaper give amazing relationship advice why are you crying 
You should really talk to your mother about that. Dad Fuel comes loaded with taurine, ginseng, and 100% of your daily recommended value of Hi Hungry, I'm Dad. I start every morning with the four D's. Devo's, donuts, Dad Fuel, down blanket. Breakfast of champions, baby. Now available in four bold flavors. Original orange, grow model raspberry, grow master mango, and I thought I told you to take out the garbage grape. You can't touch my passion. You can't touch my drive. And you definitely can't touch my thermostat. No way. So whether you're thirsty for victory or just plain thirsty. No, seriously, it's empty. Can I get another one? Dad Fuel. Because I am fearless. Because I am unstoppable. Because the players on TV aren't going to yell at themselves. Come on! Throw the ball! Happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day, we love you. Hi, Dads. Thanks for everything you do for us. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, we love you. Happy Father's Day to everyone. Happy Father's Day, Dad. We love you. Happy Father's Day. We, we love, love you.
There's a grace when the heart is on fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire. Standing
Hi everyone, I'm Kelly Vath, Peak Children's Minister. Won't you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father God, your world is hurting. It's broken and it's bruised and our hearts are troubled by the things that are going on. Some of us with righteous, justified anger and some whose blood just boils over. With broken hearts and broken spirits, we long to know what to do and we need you. God, we turn to your word and desperately search its pages for truth. We thank you that in those pages, we find Jesus and his red letters, our great example for a time such as this. Jesus knew what to do because his father showed him first. His father loved him and he in turn loved us. While we were still sinners, in fact, he loved us first. While he too was brokenhearted, he loved us first. He loved us so fiercely that he died for us. In this time, let his command to love one another as he loved us not go unnoticed. Let it dictate our actions. Holy Spirit, we ask you to tug on our hearts and lead us where we should go. Let us hold one another up in our struggles and burdens and brokenness. And Lord, help us to teach our children to do the same by our example. Let us draw near to you and the example you set in your word. Jesus promised to never leave us or forsake us, and let us not do that to one another, no matter how hard it is or how much time it takes. Lord, you know the end of this story. Thank you for your beautiful example, Father. Let us not forget that Jesus loved us first. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. So we're going to, as I mentioned last week, uh, begin in-person worship here at Family in Christ the weekend of July 11 and 12. There's going to be a Saturday service at 5 p.m. and then one new uh, Sunday morning one at 8.30 and the second one at 10.30. And we'll talk more about that next week as well. But we're looking forward so much to seeing so many of you. At the same time, some of you that aren't yet ready to come back to the facility will be continuing to offer live streaming of each of the services as well. And so at this time, we're going to receive our gifts and offerings as a, an expression of worship. As we do that, we'll have a slide up that shows you some of the ways that you can be a part of this ministry here at Family in Christ. So this summer we are tackling some questions about God that the coronavirus pandemic raises in our hearts and in our minds. And today the question I want us to take a look at is the question, can reading the Bible help us? Now that might not immediately sound like a question about God, but clearly the Bible is the primary source of information and input for many people about the nature of God. I, I'm sure that you know that the Bible is the best-selling book of all time and that it's been a bestseller every year. In fact, every year since it was first printed on that first printing press back in 1455. And so it was also that very first book that came off that press as well. 
and it's been translated over the years into 3,000 different languages and people groups, so that now, today, uh, some 95% of all the world's population have the Bible in their own heart language. In fact, speaking of that, uh, one of the global missionaries we support is a part of the Wycliffe Bible Translation team, and we are supporting them each month. Their names are Brian and Susan Fry, and they're working on Bible translations in Papua New Guinea. So here we have the Bible, bestseller of all time, translated into 3,000 languages, and the Bible, at least for three of the great world religions, is a sacred book. Islam, Christianity, Judaism. So that's over half the population of the world. So clearly, if we're going to talk about God, we, we, we need to talk about the Bible. But it's hard to talk about the Bible without also ending up asking some hard questions about it, about its believability, its, its authenticity. Can we take it seriously? And so on this day, I want us to look at what is the Bible and can we take it seriously as a place to go for truth about God? And in this coronavirus world, can reading the Bible really help us? So it's a valid question, can we really get help from it? Because the Bible was written a long time ago in another language, in another culture, in another part of the world. We don't have any of the original manuscripts that were written. One of the good things about the manuscripts back then was as they were written on vellum or papyrus, they were biodegradable. The bad news is because they were written on those kind of materials, they have biodegraded. So we don't have any of the original manuscripts. All we have are copies and copies of copies, and that's what we have to deal with. And so that's one issue. Another issue is, is the Bible something we can count on? Is it reliable or is it full of all kinds of contradictions and is it is it the kind of story that can be believed i mean there's some hard things to believe in that book stories of a guy being swallowed by a fish and coming back to tell about it people coming back to life along the way so can we really take it seriously as a source of truth about god now as with all these questions we're asking this summer, you alone are going to have to make the final decision. But this day, I'd like to have us consider four reasons why I believe reading the Bible can help you. And the first reason that reading the Bible can help is because it is indeed reliable. It is historically credible. It is something you can trust. Now, critics will indeed point out that we don't have any of those original uh, manuscripts, so how do we even know that the words we have in our Bibles today were the words that were written originally by the authors? It's a good question. There's a whole science called textual criticism that answers that question. The long and short is that it has to do with how well those books were copied over the years. And one of the things you have to understand about the people that copied the Bible over the centuries, those scribes, is that they took their work with great seriousness. They believed that they had been entrusted with a very sacred task. They believed that these words they were copying were the very words of God. And so they had all sorts of different systems to proof read the copies that they made. They would, after they had copied a particular book, not just read and to count all the words or syllables to see if they correspond to, to the original one that they had copied, but they would actually count every single letter 
so that, for example, they would know the middle letter in the book of Isaiah. And if they counted all the letters in their copy, and it wasn't the same letter that was at the center of the copy that they had been copying from, they just threw it all out. I'm sure they counted twice if it wasn't the same. But they had these elaborate ways to make sure that their copy was, was a perfect copy, as much as possible, of what they had received. So what about all those dates and names and places? Uh, there's a lot of them, and there's a lot of stories, a lot of numbers. Some of those are hard to understand and hard to believe. But it's striking that as time's gone on, that nearly every notable name, nearly every important location has been confirmed either by other historical documents or traditions or by archaeological discoveries. A couple examples. For longtime critics of the Bible argued that there was no way that, that Moses could have been responsible for the first five books of the Bible because back in his day, the 1400 BCs, before that, uh, before or during that time, there really wasn't any writing available. People hadn't invented writing yet. And then archaeologists discovered a thing called the Code of Hammurabi that was a code, a law code etched in stone that had been done some 300 years before the time of Moses. So it's entirely possible that Moses could re be responsible for those first books of the Bible. Another example, early critics used to argue that the biblical account of the fall of Jericho couldn't be relied upon because everybody knew that walls were built in ancient cities so that when they fell, if they fell, they would always fall inward. And the Bible says clearly that the walls of Jericho fell outward. So obviously the account is not accurate until in 1901, they excavated the city of Jericho to discover that indeed the walls had fallen outward, as the text in the Bible says. So the historical reliability of the Bible. But the centerpiece of the Bible is clearly the story of Jesus. Those four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the evidence strongly suggests that that those accounts were composed by folks who had carefully researched and constructed their accounts based on first-hand eyewitness accounts of people that were there. One of those writers, a guy by the name of Luke, was both a physician and a historian, and here's how he describes the process of putting his book together. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, were, who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophil Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So it's clear that, that Luke takes his uh, work very seriously, constructing this account of his gospel. And he uses these reliable witnesses. And when we read the gospels, we have not just one or two or three, but four accounts of the story of Jesus from four different perspectives, by four different authors with their own particular personality and their own point of view and their own audience in mind. And yet together, there is a remarkable consistency in their reports and their conclusions about his life. Most scholars will agree that all, or at least most of all the documents in the New Testament were compiled during the very first century. In fact, most of the books in the New Testament were written sometime between 15 and 30 years 
after the life and times of Jesus. Now, that means that, that they were written down during the time in which the people who lived through those experiences, who heard Jesus speak, who saw those events, were still alive. And they could either corroborate or refute those things. Now, 15 years is really not a lot of time between an event and the record of that being given. For example, if someone today were to write a, a kind of a magazine article and made the case that on September 11th, 2001, it was only one plane that smashed into both those towers on 9-11 in the World Trade Center. That one plane went through both of those towers at the same instant. Now, it could be a, a, an important theory to suggest, but look, we've got countless eyewitnesses and we have reams of film to discredit that account. And so that's why these early written accounts are so important. Now contrast that to some of the other so-called Gospels, what are called the Gnostic Gospels. They were made famous several years back by the Da Vinci Code book and movie. These Gospels were written some 100 to 200 years after Jesus' life, and they show none of the marks of authenticity and eyewitness accounts at all. And then there are those so-called contradictions that as you really look at them, well, there really aren't that many after all. Most of them can be explained by simply being different reports of similar accounts or reporting the same account in a different sort of a way. For example, at the early morning hours of Easter when those people come to the tomb, one gospel account says that the women saw two angels. Another says that there was only one angel present. Well, it's probably just a difference in how they reported it. One of the accounts is probably reporting one angel that speaks and forgets about announcing the, the uh, presence of another that doesn't. And so you have those kind of things along the way. And then you have things like what look like paradoxical truths that seem to be contradictions. For example, Proverbs 26, 5 says, Answer a fool according to his folly. The verse before it says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly. So, which is it? Well, both Proverbs can well be true, it just depends on which fool we're talking about, right? And so there are those kind of contradictions that are really not, but then there are some that don't seem at this point to be yet resolved, but they're really inconsequential to the scope and the message of the Bible. And so we could go on with great length, just talk more about it, but understand that when you look at the Bible, you're looking at a, a book that is historically reliable, and it's the account of people's experience and thoughts and the encounters they have about and with God. So the first reason that you can read the Bible and be helped by doing so is because the Bible is trustworthy. It's reliable. It's something you can count on. That's the first reason that reading the Bible can help. Second reason that reading the Bible can help you is because it's beautiful. I mean, the Bible contain, contains some of the most finest and enduring language and words that have ever been written. I mean, you consider it for a minute. The Bible's composed of 66 books written over 1,500 years by 40-some authors and in a whole variety of different types of literature or genre. Some of the books are history, some are poetry, 
Some are prophecies, some are apocalyptic literature, some are didactic instructional sections, and yet, together, there's one story there from beginning to end. It's the story of heroism and courage and redemption. It's the story of triumph over tragedy and, and good over evil and love conquering all. It's one single story. And the words that are used are enduring words, words that continue to resonate in our hearts and lives. The Lord is my shepherd. I will lack no good thing. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down one's life for one's friend. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but have not love, I am nothing. These words and countless others are among the most familiar, the most beloved, and the most powerful words that have ever been spoken in any language, and they bring hope and comfort and strength to people in all the different times of their lives. The scriptures are beautiful. Now, to be sure, there are those tedious sections, like long lists of... Uh, of laws in Leviticus and uh, the genealogies of First Chronicles and Matthew, and there are difficult and disturbing sections as well about judgment and slavery and violence, and we've talked about those things in the last couple of weeks. But even in those serious or difficult and tedious sections, when you understand the larger scope, the larger whole, and how all of that fits together in this larger unfolding revelation of God's story, it hangs together as this hopeful and redemptive and beautiful story. Now, sometimes I'm asked, well, so how am I to understand the Bible? Shall I read it and take it literally? No, I will tell you. Don't take it literally unless you want to gouge out your right eye and throw it away every time you have a covetous uh, view or something that you want. But that's what Jesus said. But he was using a figure of speech, and we understand that. We understand you don't take the Bible literally. You take it naturally. You take it as it was meant to be understood, as it was meant to be read. And so you take into account the kind of literature that you're reading. So, for example, when you are reading history, you expect it to be accurate. When you are reading poetry, you expect it to be beautiful. When you are reading didactic informational sections, you expect it to be clear. When you're reading a parable, you're expecting it to be made up. And when you're reading apocalyptic literature, like the book of Revelation, you expect to be confused. But that's just because we're so unacquainted with that kind of literature, not the people that got the letter back in John's day. But the whole point is we use common sense when we read the Bible. We take into account the different kinds of language and the genre. And we take into account the historical and cultural setting, as we said a couple weeks ago. For example, when Paul says to women, don't braid your hair or wear jewelry when you go to church. Well, if we take that literally, 
half of you won't even be available to come to our services that we are going to begin in person in three weeks from now. We understand that Paul is speaking in an historical moment to a particular culture at that time. At the same time, however, we also believe that, that as he speaks to those cultural moments, he is also laying down timeless truths that speak to all times. He's speaking here about inner beauty, real beauty. He's speaking here about the importance of modesty. And so when we read the Bible, we read it naturally, not literally. So just one final thought on this beauty idea. You know, I've been studying and teaching, preaching the Bible, honestly, much of my life on Easter, this past Easter, I realized that, that I had preached my 36th Easter sermon. 36 of these things, the same text, the same story, the same empty tomb, the same angels are there. And guess what? Everyone knows how the story ends. There's not a surprise when you read it the next year. And yet, every single year, there's something new in that story. There's something fresh. There's something surprising there. There's something in that story that is intriguing and challenging and unsettling and comforting and something that is hopeful and brings wonder to us. Every single year, that story never gets old. It never gets stale. It never gets predictable. And that's the second reason that the Bible can help you because it is beautiful. The third reason that reading the Bible can help is because it is relevant. It speaks to every human experience. Even though it was written thousands and thousands of years ago, it speaks to all the variety of the human condition and has something to say to us today. Something about our world, our coronavirus world in which we live. Listen to what one Bible writer said about the Bible itself. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Now those words were written almost 3,000 years ago by someone who began his life as a shepherd who came from nowhere and ended up his life as one of the most famous kings to ever live, King David. And he, David, experienced some of the best and some of the worst of life and humanity. And he says that these words of scripture have throughout his life guided him and given him comfort and hope and help. And countless other people throughout the ages have said the very same thing. Reading the Bible can help you because it speaks to our lives today. It is still relevant. So listen to what one contemporary writer says about the Bible. It's about God and greed and grace, about life, lust, laughter, and loneliness. It's about birth, beginnings, and betrayal about siblings, squabbles, and sex, about power and prayer and prison and passion. And that's only Genesis. And so from time to time, people will come up to me after a message and say, have you been reading my mail? To which I'll simply say, well, the only reason I can speak to what you're talking about and going through is because that's what the Bible speaks about. The Bible has been reading your mail. The Bible knows what you're going through. So uh, a couple nights ago, while I was still working on the sermon, I, well, I found myself uh, discouraged by everything that's going on in this world right now and some of the setbacks that 
Judy and I have felt the last few weeks. I was texting my daughter and she was talking and giving me perspective and it helped. But then I went back up to bed at the end of the night and pulled out the prayer book that Judy and I read at night. And the reading for the day was from Psalm 55. Listen, I called to God and the Lord saves me evening, morning, and noon. I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. And those words that were written 3,000 years ago by that same shepherd king, in that moment, brought me hope and comfort and sleep. Reading the Bible helps, not just because it's reliable, not just because it's beautiful, but also because it's relevant to our lives. It speaks to all the experiences that we go through in every age of human history. And finally, let me suggest that reading the Bible can help because it's inspired. Now, that word inspired is a loaded word in many ways because of there's a lot of wrangling about what it really means, especially among people that are part of churches along the way. And however it is you define it, it's probably something we can all agree in, that the Bible is one book that that apl word applies to. The English word inspired comes from the Latin word, which means to breathe or to blow into. And it brings to mind the, the picture of God breathing life into that dust that he had formed into the shape of a human being. And so when we say something is inspired, we're saying it's filled with something. It's filled with power and energy and joy and life and hope. And I hope that when you read the Bible, that's what you are filled with. But when I say the Bible is inspired, I don't mean it's inspiring. It is that, but it, it is also inspired. That is, the book itself is filled with God's energy and power. In fact, the very power of God. One of the Greek words for inspired shows up in a verse in the Bible. Paul speaks about it in 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the idea is that as the authors of scripture remembered and wrote down words and the works and the events that tell us about God and their interactions with God, they wrote them down in such a way that God was directing them to particular words sometimes and to certain ways of saying things at other times, but that these words were guided by him so that they were filled with his purposes and his perspective. So we're not saying that God just kind of dictated uh, to these authors like they were scribal androids that were programmed, programmed to write what they wrote. The authors each use their own language and vocabulary and perspective when they write. And yet, somehow, when God inspired them to write scripture, he came alongside of them in such a unique way that he was guiding them as they wrote so that what they wrote was somehow bigger than they normally wrote when they wrote a letter to their mom, say, for example. And so that's what we mean when we talk about it, the Bible being inspired. We're saying it is unlike any other book that has ever been written for its reliability, for its beauty, for its relevance, and for its impact on people and on the world. Now, there's lots of other sacred books in other traditions along the way, some of which are also beautiful and 
reliable or relevant for sure, but when you take all of these things together, they just can't compare to scripture. For example, some of the sacred writings of other faiths are written by one person, the Quran or the Book of Mormon. One person wrote it in one time period. Other sacred words, works, such as the Hindu writings, are, are written throughout many different centuries, but only one genre, that is, uh, only the kind of literature that is not grounded in history or any kind of events that can be looked at for accuracy or reliability. And so while there could be beauty and truth and goodness in some of those writings, and they're all worth re reading if you're so interested, they don't compare to the Bible. However you take the word inspired, understand that the Bible is unlike any other book. Well, so I know I told you that there were going to be four reasons for reading the Bible, but actually there's one more I want to tack on. I didn't want to scare you off, but I really need to take a moment to talk about this last one. And that is the fifth reason for reading the Bible and why reading it will help you is because it will point you to Jesus. See, we spoke earlier about the unity of the Bible, even though it's written over a period of many centuries, many cultures, many experiences, it tells one story. What's the story? It's the story of Jesus, the story of God entering human history in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. He came to rescue us from ourselves and to restore the world to its original splendor. From beginning to end, that's the story of the Bible, and that story points to Jesus. From the beginning, opening chapters of Genesis, where we read that one would come who was born of a woman and one day conquer evil, to the very last book, in the closing chapters of Revelation, where we read about a lamb that is seated upon the throne who will rule over the new heaven and the new earth. And at the very center of that book, the Gospels that give us the accounts of Jesus from four different but consistent experiences along the way. Listen to what one of those authors says about Jesus in the Gospel. So the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Now, that strikes me that John begins his Gospel that way. The Word became flesh. As if to say, as beautiful, as reliable, as inspiring, as impactful, as relevant as all these written words are, words alone are not enough to reveal who God is and what God is all about. For that kind of understanding of who God is, we need a living word, one who embodies all that can be known and can be understood about God. And that person that embodies God is Jesus, the most compelling person who ever lived. And the Bible points to him from beginning to end so that that alone, that alone makes reading the Bible worth it because it points to Jesus. So, once again, this is a bit of a theological, maybe even an academic kind of a conversation today. So let me finish with a story. It's the story of one person's experience with the Bible. Well, right before the theaters shut down, Judy and I went over to see the promenade, to the promenade and watch the movie 1917 about the Great War. And as I was watching that film, I was reminded of the story of a man by the name of Emile Caillé. Caillé was a young man in France when the war broke out and he found himself on the front lines of that horrific affair. So let me just tell his story with his own words that he wrote. 
During my college days in France, I was an agnostic and graduated without ever having seen a Bible. But the education I received proved to be of little help in the trenches when your buddy dies standing in front of you, a bullet in his chest. Was there meaning to it all? The inadequacies of my views of the human predicament overwhelmed me. One night, a bullet found me too. And after a nine month stay in the hospital, I was discharged and resumed my graduate work. I remember how during those long night watches, a few yards from the enemy lines, as I looked at swollen bodies dangling in the barbed wires, I had strangely longed for, it sounds odd to say it, a book that would understand me. But I knew of no such book. So now, as I went on reading for my studies, I would file passages that spoke to my condition and carefully copy them into a leather-bound book I carried with me at all times. Well, the day came when I put the finishing touches on the book that would understand me, that would help me through life's happenings, lead me from fear and anguish to relief and joy. A beautiful sunny day it was, I went out, sat under a tree, and opened my precious anthology. As I was, went on reading, however, a growing disappointment came over me. Instead of speaking to my condition, the various passages merely reminded me of their context and my labor over their selection. Suddenly, I knew that the whole undertaking would not work, simply because it was of my own making. In a dejected mood, I put the little book back in my pocket. At that very moment, my wife, who knew nothing about the project I'd been working on, appeared at the garden gate with something in her hand. She had been out for a walk with a baby on a hot afternoon and had taken shelter from the sun in an old building, which turned out to be a church. She bumped into the minister who gave her a Bible in French. Now, I should confess at this point that I made the subject of religion, absolutely taboo in our home. So she was about to apologize for even telling me the story, but I interrupted her. A Bible, you say, show me. I I've never seen one before. I literally grabbed the book and rushed to my study with it. I opened it and chanced upon the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, I read and read and read. Now out loud with indescribable warmth surging within, I could not find words to express my awe and wonder. And all of a sudden, the realization dawned upon me. This was the book that would understand me. I continued to read deep into the night, mostly from the gospel, and as I did, the one to whom they spoke became alive to me as if its pages were animated by the presence of the living God. To this God I prayed that night, and the God who answered was the same God of whom it was spoken in the book. Kaye went on to become a dearly loved and highly regarded Bible scholar and seminary professor, and for the rest of his life, he began every day opening that book, reflecting on it, and finding out what it had to say, because he had finally discovered the book that had found him, the book that had understood him, the book that was forming him into the man he finally became. And that is why reading the Bible helps. That's why we can take it seriously, because whatever else you might think of it, you can't deny it is unlike any other book in its reliability, in its beauty, 
in its relevance, in its inspiration. The Bible will find you, will understand you, will form you, and will point you to Jesus if you let it. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful that this book is so readily available to us in America today. Many of us have more copies on our shelf than we know what to do with. And Lord, we thank you for the message of that book and how it longs to inform our lives. And will you use it to renew our love for you? Will you use it to renew our commitment to you and to each other? And Lord, for those who are still exploring that book, will you continue to urge them on to consider the unique book that it is and how it can speak so powerfully into their lives? And so, Lord, for all of us, we pray that, that you will continue to use this book to be a source of strength and hope in these days of uncertainty for our lives, our country, and our world. So that indeed we will one day be able to look back with a sense of knowing that, that you really are overseeing all of history as you have from the very beginning. Give us your peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, the only one who could ever see, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you, Lord. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none
So may you build your life on the love of God and may scripture be something that continues to inform you and shape you. The love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you now and ever.